So, uh, so reorienting Orientalism means not just turning our attention back to the East, but also correcting the interpretation. Reorienting often means you need to correct correct your your uh, attitude, your orientation. So, uh, this is our this is our program, and this is what I'll describe. So, uh, uh, yeah. So reorienting Orientalism. So we'll talk a little bit about what the term Orientalism means and and what uh, what the project of Orientalism is. A little bit about cultural chauvism and what is called sometimes subaltern studies. Subaltern studies uh, viewed from different angles. I mean the uh, the uh, Western scholars and colonial scholars uh, often uh, considered the other as something subordinate to themselves, as as a lower kind of uh, knowledge, and uh, and peoples of other places as as less valuable than they were. So that in that sense, this alter means other, and sub is is a uh, lower, right? So subaltern studies. Um, is a, the study of the of the of the other as lesser, but it's also then the study of cultures that have been oppressed. So we'll look at look at those attitudes and uh, and the role that uh, European philosophy itself has played in this kind of understanding. And the and and that role has. Uh, a history, which I'll go over very quickly, culminating in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, which has really defined the humanities since then. And talk about how, uh, with the Marxist uh, interpretation, a reinterpretation of Hegel, Marx was a student of Hegel's, uh, he uh, made it into a phenomenology of materialism rather than a phenomenology of spirit in the uh, uh, dialectical materialism. And we'll talk about how fundamentalism is another attitude, the opposite of that, which uh, also misinterprets uh, the scientists and the texts. And talk about how uh, what the what the attitude of the humanities is versus the attitude in objective science and how this affects Indian studies. So let's start with Orientalism. The Orient is the East. Orientalism is the stuff and characteristics relating to the East and the study of and behavior towards the East. An Orientalist scholar is one who studies the East. So the term Orientalism itself places the scholar engaged in the discipline at the center of the universe while it displaces the object of study in the East. So the term was was used in Europe and uh, everything to the East of that uh, was considered the Orient, including the Middle East, uh, India, and uh, the Far East, uh, China and Japan. Now, in the 70s, Edward Said wrote a book called Orientalism, and he recognizes this definition of an Orientalism, a neutral definition of Orientalism, which is anyone who researches the Orient. Okay? And, and what they do is Orientalism. But, uh, but it has a different sense than that as well. It's a style of thought based on an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and the Occident. So there have been many writers who have accepted this basic distinction as the starting point for elaborate theories, saying that the, the Orient is, is, uh, is more spiritual and the West is, is more rational. And then that's why... They justified that's why science was successful in the West and and it's not in the East. This kind of thinking and 
discussion and justification of of certain developments and the justification of colonialist rule was made. So it was a way for the Western colonial uh, empires to dominate, restructure, and have authority over the countries considered oriental. So uh, then it's the it's the general group of ideas that organize the whole mass of material of of uh, of doctrines of knowledge uh, and uh, and interpretation of ideas expressed in those cultures an interpretation of them in a way that makes European knowledge superior and, and also Europeans superior. So it includes racism and imperialism and justifies them. And so all academic knowledge about India and Egypt, uh, Said was mostly concerned with, with the knowledge in, in uh, Africa and, and uh, the Middle East, and Egypt, But all knowledge, it applies equally to the Far East, uh, all knowledge about India is somehow tinged and impressed with, violated by the gross political fact of European, principally British and French, colonial uh, su superiority. Said also asserts that it uh, justifies American economic interest in these countries. Now, uh, Said recognizes that there's a, a nationalism, a, a, a sort of chauvinism. It's called chauvinism because uh, Chauvin, a French uh, politician, was, uh, was one who had, had this attitude in, in France. But it, uh, uh, it tells, it discusses a, a certain reactive or paranoid nationalism that uh, is frequently woven into the very fabric of education where children, as well as older students, are taught to venerate and celebrate the uniqueness of their tradition, usually and invidiously at the expense of others. So in America, we're, we were taught that, you know, America is great and in in Europe, they're taught that, you know, Europe is great and everybody else is, is uh, lesser. But it's also true that we find this in nowadays, contemporary, in India and in, in uh, China and where, everywhere else, that, uh, that the textbooks taught to children glorify their own political uh, situation at the expense of, of others. And this kind of uncritical and unthinking forms of education and thought, uh, this book is, that is Said's book, was addressed as a corrective. He in particular is concerned about European chauvinism and European nationalism uh, in that way as a corrective. Now, uh, then he talks about uh, fundamentalism and notices that religious fervor seems almost always to obscure notions of the sacred or divine, as if those could not survive in the overheated, largely secular atmosphere of fundamentalist combat. So, so you find, for example, today, uh, in, in justification of, of Islam, the, the most grotesque and bestial violence. And, uh, and th this kind of this kind of uh, thing is hardly religious, right? It's hardly religious at all. To to in the name of the defense of Allah, to to march into uh, uh, the publishers of of comics and and murder them is is hardly something that can take place uh, in the name of God. But uh, but this kind of fundamentalist attitude is 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 prevalent worldwide now. Uh, we find it also in in the Christianity, particularly of the of the Middle Ages, uh, 
where uh, where the uh, Inquisition uh, burned people at the stake uh, for disagreement with with uh, Christian doctrines, and in America they burned so-called witches. The word witch means someone who's knowledgeable. So it was someone who was knowledgeable in things that were were not necessarily Christian doctrine, and therefore. And therefore, they were taken to be competitive with Christian doctrine and 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 murdered, basically. And this could hardly be something that could take place in the name of true religion. So, so uh, Sayyid notices this paradox that uh, religious fervor uh, obscures the divine uh, very often, and that's true. We'll talk about how that's true today in, in fundamentalist attitudes which are current in India. Now, uh, Said's uh, thesis in this book, Orientalism, was that without examining Orientalism as a discourse, one cannot possibly understand the enormously systematic discipline by which European culture was able to manage and even produce the Orient politically, sociologically, militarily, ideologically, scientifically, and imaginatively during the post-Enlightenment period. He says, the phenomenon, the study of Orientalism has very little to contribute to the facts about the Orient. In other words, he's studying, in his, in his study of Orientalism, what he's studying is the attitudes of the Europeans towards the Orient. He's not studying the Orient, right? He's not studying Egyptian knowledge, Indian knowledge. He's studying European attitudes towards those places. So, as he says, the phenomenon of Orientalism, as I study it here, deals principally not with a correspondence between Orientalism and Orient, but with the internal consistency of Orientalism and its ideas about the Orient, despite or beyond any correspondence or lack thereof with a real Orient. So he's not studying the East. He's not studying India, not studying the Middle East. He's studying Europeans. Now, this kind of project, this is called being theoretical. Okay, and 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 dissertations have been encouraged, speakers encouraged, and uh, people hired and put in positions because they deal theoretically with this kind of Orientalism that is engaged with the ideas of Western scholars towards the Orient rather than towards the real understanding of the Orient. So, so you find in, for example, the Columbia South Asia Seminar abstracts phrases that are all about this kind of, of doctrine. So I've highlighted them in red here, these phrases, colonial era, concepts of political sovereignty. Okay, does this have anything to do with, with the, the thinking in the nations over which the colonial powers ruled? Not at all. Okay, and, th and then there are other theoretical concerns also. This politics of modernity. Uh, you have fine phrases like this, marked markers of stark otherness. Uh, they always mention power. It's all about political power and about uh, wielding their power and confrontation. And you find also the word negotiation. Okay, so all these kinds of terms have to be present in the theoretical discourses, doctoral dissertations, scholarly papers, and so forth, for scholars to be considered to be sophisticated. They have to talk about hermeneutics, about the negotiation of one way of understanding with another way of understanding. They have to discuss gender, uh, transgenderism, uh, imperial conquest. They talk about a narrative that's put forward by scholars, uh, and uh, and they they love this term provocative, right? So all these terms have to be in 
your your writing as a scholar in other word in, in order to be considered a serious scholar capable of doing a theoretical valuable theoretical work otherwise you're not hired in any positions you're not invited for lectures uh basically you're you're banished from the scholarly community now uh, Rajiv Malhotra is a popular one popular figure who recognized this kind of Orientalism. He's, he's familiar with Said's book and simil- familiar with the attitudes uh, of it. And he's undertaken to argue against um, colonialist kind of domination of India in particular. But what he has done actually is in his book, Being Different, is is talk about reversing the gaze, okay? He uses this expression, reversing the gaze, and repositioning India from being the observed to the observer and looking at the West from the Dharmic point of view. Now, in doing this, what he's, what he's advocating is to do the opposite of what the Europeans did. He's, he's urging particularly Indian scholars, but others who sympathize, to to do the same thing to the West that India, that the the European powers did to the East. Okay? So in doing so, he engages in the same kind of discourse that the Orientalist scholars do. And so he comes into dialogue with them because he uses the same kind of language the same kind of discussion about power and domination and uh, uh, negotiating positions and so forth. And uh, and so uh, very often taking the opposite position is not one that transcends that uh, narrow point of view to actually uh, evolve to a superior way of looking at things. And this, this I feel is, uh, you know, he's justified in his criticisms, but he's also out of date. He's, he's arguing against, uh, attitudes that most scholars have abandoned a long time ago. But I will say that, you know, the Orientalists, okay. Uh, these scholars, such as Saeed, they're also still prevalent in the, in the U.S. in a new way because, because the Orientalist dialogue is with themselves. Even though they recognized the domination of colonial powers over the East, they have a sort of new kind of Orientalism, which means that only people who engage in their kind of theoretical discussion can be considered seriously. Whereas the Europeans considered that only Europeans can be considered seriously, and and the scholarship of of India and other places in the in the in the East, the relative East, uh, were were not serious scholarship. They were just expressions of that culture, not uh, absolute knowledge, uh, and only the Europeans have universal knowledge. And this is something that. Uh, uh, Malhotra has also recognized that Europeans claim to have universal knowledge, and he act, but he actually uh, doesn't want to interpret Indian knowledge as universal knowledge. He wants to interpret Indian knowledge as superior to uh, Western knowledge, and and subordinate the the, the West. So this kind of opposite attitude is is not productive. Uh, it, it's also uh, engaging in in theoretical ideas, which are in opposition to other theoretical ideas. But they're all in this sphere of theoretical discussion around certain issues of subordination and subalternism, which don't engage in the the true ideas expressed as scientific ideas in the Indian tradition. Now, uh, even uh, Sheldon Pollock, who is, who, who is one of the scholars who, in my opinion, is most guilty 
of this new kind of Orientalism where uh, they respect only these theoretical ideas. Even he recognizes that this has overstepped, okay, that theoretical discussion has has overstepped its bounds. He says the hypertrophy of theory, okay, the overabundance of theory over the past two decades uh, has often wound up displacing its object of analysis. Okay, in other words, people are not concerned with the real object of analysis, which is what is what is expressed in the Sanskrit texts, what is uh, what does Indian knowledge have to offer uh, the world in understanding reality? Uh, they're no longer engaged in that, which is the real object of analysis, but they're engaged in theoretical discussion about uh, attitudes and uh, and confrontation and uh, subordination and so forth. So all all the new uh, uh, dissertations are engaged in this kind of of stuff, and uh, and they don't uh, don't engage in true scholarship. Very few scholars are engaged in in true scholarship with regard to India today. Now, this is my uh, my take on this, is that the, the disciplines of subaltern studies and critical theory have become the new point of view from which all knowledge is validated and rela- in relation to which all knowledge is subsumed. Only those who engage in subaltern studies and critical theory are considered able to produce valid knowledge. Genuine and essential knowledge is being neglected in favor of a small set of theoretical concerns. And this is why we need to reorient Orientalism. Now, let's talk, this is, this is uh, uh, so I've summarized what goes on in the academic um, tradition now. And let's take a quick look at European philosophy and the relationship between consciousness and reality. So Descartes uh, is is famous for having recognized that there's uh, there's physical reality versus spiritual reality. There are these two realms, and uh, and the conscious realm is the is the uh, object of of mental functioning and the physical of body body functioning, and these two realms are are separate from each other. Uh, and John Locke, however, uh, disagreed with the identification of the spirit as a as an entity uh, which is responsible for our identity. In other words, uh, the soul is the thinking thing, and that is the person. What he recognized was that personal identity consists in the identity of consciousness. That is, it's what you're aware of and your your memory and what whatever what your consciousness can bring into a, a single frame of reference that determines your personal identity. Uh, it's not determined by identity with a substance, as Descartes considered the soul to be a substance, but only by the identity of consciousness. And David Hume uh, now is considered the ultimate empiricist. Okay, uh, they're they're recognizing that uh, certain ideas or impressions come in through our senses, the five senses, uh, sight and hearing in particular. Uh, and uh, and these form some kind of impressions in our in our memory, and we somehow organize these various impressions into concepts uh, of wholes, and we have concepts of the world, concepts in the world, concepts like table and chair when we're only. Uh, given impressions of different colors and and shapes as distinct distinct impressions, and yet somehow we coordinate all of these. But he couldn't figure out how we do this coordination. 
So, uh, so he says, when we talk of the self, okay, this talking about our knowledge of ourself now, rather than knowledge of objects, when we talk about our self or substance, self as the internal thing and substance as the basis of some external thing, a real entity, we must have some idea annexed to these terms. We have to have an idea of such a substance. But every idea is derived from preceding impressions. And we have no impression of a self or of a substance. Okay, substance, a dravya in Sanskrit, a thing, self, atman. He says we have no such impression as something simple and individual. And so all these perceptions are distinct that come in through our senses or that uh, pop into our, our mind on the thinking level. And so they're separately existent. They're all independent thoughts. All the thoughts we have in our mind are independent. We have no idea of external substance of a thing distinct from the ideas of particular qualities like color and shape and light, heavy, so forth, so forth, that are the impressions we get from our experience. And likewise, with regard to the mind, we have no notion of it distinct from particular perceptions, that is particular, particular images, thoughts, feelings, and so on. And so uh, he, he recognized that he could not find any way that we actually can justify the experience which we actually have of things like our mind, our identity, or the identity of objects in the world. He says, all my hopes vanish when I come to explain the principles that unite our successive per perceptions in our thought or consciousness. I cannot discover any theory which gives me satisfaction on this head. He writes this in an appendix as he was reading over his, his uh, book uh, uh, again. And, uh, and then he gives up philosophy and he goes into the discipline of history. So he says, in short, there are two principles which I cannot render consistent, nor is it in my power to renounce either of them, namely that all our distinct impressions, all our distinct perceptions are distinct existences, and that the mind never perceives any real connection among distinct existences. Yet we have the conception of wholes, both objects, substances, and the self. Others may discover some hypothesis that will reconcile those contradictions. Okay, so he gives up and then Immanuel Kant reads his work in Germany, and uh, he says reading uh, Hume's work awakened him from his dogmatic slumber. In other words, he had assumed certain things about you know the typical approach of Cartesianism, that is the doctrines of Descartes, and uh, and Hume opened his eyes to to thinking through things and i think he did think through things in an extremely profound way that uh that really affected our our understanding of things and our understanding of sciences in the west he said if each representation that is each impression as hume used the term were completely foreign to every other standing apart in isolation no such thing as knowledge would ever arise for knowledge is essentially a whole in which representations, that is impressions, stand compared and connected with each other. He continues, there can be in us no items of knowledge, no connection or unity of one item of knowledge with another without that unity of consciousness which precedes all data of intuitions. And, and so he picks up on what Locke had recognized, that consciousness is fundamental. 
that unity of consciousness, which precedes all data of intuitions. By intuitions, he means impressions, both of, of uh, things that come through the senses and of internal impressions of feelings and uh, imagination and so forth. Okay, so this unity of consciousness, which precedes all data of intuitions, and by relation to which representation of objects is alone possible. This pure, original, unchangeable consciousness, I shall name transcendental apperception. So this transcendental apperception, this unity of consciousness, he recognizes as fundamental to all knowledge. And we do have knowledge, and therefore, as an essential presupposition of the experience we have, we have to recognize that there is such a thing as this transcendental unity of consciousness. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the experience that we do have of knowledge. And so this is his pure reason. His reasoning is his critique of Reinen Vernunft, the critique of pure reason. This kind of reasoning, he's reasoning as the from the presuppositions, about the presuppositions to our experience to establish that uh, we do have a unity of consciousness. But Kant considered that the there was a certain faculty that humans were humans had of, of knowledge, and that they they couldn't change that perception. They couldn't change the kind of knowledge they had and and that their knowledge was limited. They could not know how things were in actual reality. And he talks about how they can't know the thing as it is in itself, nor can they know their own self as it is in their, in itself. Uh, because, because that's beyond uh, uh, the sort of... Uh, uh, screen of our knowledge, which sifts everything that comes in to our senses through certain categories. And Kant uh, enumerated 12 categories. I won't go into detail, but they include such things as uh, causality and uh, the idea of, of, of uh, substance and so on. And so that uh, this is why Descartes, he said, uh, failed to understand things properly because Descartes assumed that uh, the self was a substance, whereas the idea of substance is something that uh, that is dictated by the way the frame that human knowledge is sift things through. So, so making the soul into a substance uh, uh, turns it into an external object as we perceive. But but what we perceive through the senses is not the real nature. It's only nature as we perceive it. But he considered that humans perceive things according to the human way of understanding, the human faculty of understanding. It can't change. But he puts in a footnote that there could be other beings, other types of beings. And what he meant was like God, uh, which could perceive things as they actually are in themselves. Okay, so he acknowledges that. Now, Hegel, in my view, picks up on that footnote. And, and he also uh, recognizes that, uh, that Kant is committing a fault by uh, not only he, but all the others who were preoccupied with methodology and empiricism in in his time that uh that somehow uh uh we well i'll just read this this quote which puts it in 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 brief he says it is a natural assumption that in philosophy before we start to deal with its proper subject matter that is the actual cognition of what truly is, one must first of all come to an understanding about cognition, which is regarded either as an instrument to get hold of the absolute or as the medium through which one discovers it. Okay, so, so one has to study empiricism before one can actually know what there actually is in reality. And, and, 
and one never gets to actually studying what there is in reality because one's preoccupied with these other things. And he considers it sort of an excuse why we can't know things. So, so consciousness, he says, according to the scientists, stands on one side and reality on another. And, uh, and one can't uh, rec reconcile the two. So he says this, this attitude towards knowledge takes for granted certain ideas about cognition as an instrument and as a medium and assumes that there is a difference between ourselves and this cognition. Above all, it presupposes that the absolute stands on one side and the cognition on the other, independent and separated from it, and yet it is something real. Or in other words, it presupposes that cognition, which, since it is excluded from the absolute, is surely outside the truth as well, true the truth as re as well, that is outside reality as well, is nevertheless true. An assumption whereby what calls itself fear of error reveals itself rather as fear of the truth. This is a, a brilliant observation on Hegel's part. Okay, uh, and uh, so he he recognizes this conclusion stems from the fact that the absolute alone is true or the truth alone is absolute. In other words, true knowledge has to recognize that consciousness is reality. Absolute knowledge is where our appearance is identical with essence. In his Phenomenology of Spirit, he talks about the march of consciousness towards this understanding of absolute knowledge. And he analyzes various cultures in the world and the kinds of attitudes they had towards knowledge. And, uh, and that is his phenomenology of spirit. And that phenomenology of spirit was, was quite a lengthy work. It goes into detail about different uh, viewpoints, different world views, so to speak, held by different cultures of the world. And uh, he examines which one is, is more uh, progressive, which one has progressed more towards absolute knowledge than the others. And he, he considers Christianity to be uh, quite close to the peak of this because, because Christ was supposed to be in Christianity, is supposed to be in Christianity, the, the son of, of God, and therefore in human form, uh, a human being who is at once the incarnation of, of the absolute, and yet recognizes himself as being the absolute, and yet is individual. And so, uh, so it's quite close. Now, now, all you who are listening are quite aware that in, in the Indian tradition as well, in Hinduism, particularly in the figure of Krishna, who's a self-conscious avatara of the absolute, recognizing his, his, his identity with, uh, with Brahman, one might say, the, the, the absolute transcendent unity of all, Satchit Ananda, okay? If Krishna is the embodiment of that in an individual form. He obviously uh, um, represents the ideal of what Hegel is talking about. And the Indian discussion of Advaita Vedanta is, is, is really the epitome of this recognition of the identity of reality and consciousness. Now, uh, Hegel's influence uh, on on the humanities was because of his phenomenology of his spirit, not because of his recognition of the identity of consciousness with, with reality, which is, uh, is, is uh, ironic. But, uh, but what the humanities became was the continuation of Hegel's kind of phenomenology of spirit, except it lost the spirit part of it. Uh, Marx, as a student of, of Hegel, turned it upside down and talked about the uh, phenomenology of, of uh, not the phenomenology of spirit, but dialectical empiricism. Uh, so dialectical materialism. 
It was, it was how not one attitude changes into another, but how one state of society changes into another, one culture changes into another. And he took Hegel's representation of how uh, one idea is, is then met with an opposing idea. And then these two wrestle with each other to, to come transcend either and come to a higher understanding of things. Well, Marx, uh, took that into the uh, material world as a position, an opposite position, and revolution. But uh, this was this is some I'm presenting some uh, characterizations of the humanities here. But uh, basically, the idea is that humanities is looking at the expressions of the human mind as expressions of certain ideas and certain understandings. So it's historical. It's it's appropriate to various cultures, okay? It, it, it looks at the cultural conceptions of different societies as cultural exceptions, uh, expressions, as, as expressions of that relative culture, not as absolute truth. Now, uh, as I mentioned, Marx turned it upside down. He, he talks about... Uh, uh, the fact that it's not man's consciousness that determines their existence, but on the contrary, their social existence that determines their consciousness. So he's looking at, and humanities has come to look at how the social circumstances in which a person uh, lives determines their ideas. In other words, they're not creative ideas of consciousness expressing itself. There's nothing, nothing brilliant it's all a product, not of human brilliance, but of the society and the uh, conditions of the society. So he denigrates the conscious subject and gives primacy to social relations and it's purely a materialistic worldview. He even says in his Communist Manifesto <clears throat> that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Society as a whole is more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, the bourgeoisie and proletariat. And, uh, and he urged the forcible overthrow of all social existing social conditions. In other words, a violent revolution. So dialectical materialism uh, recognizes in materialism that the only objects that are real are those uh, perceptible by the five senses and consciousness is just epiphenomenal. It's unreal. The history of ideas is primary the product of social and economic forces, forces rather than the product of intelligence of authors. And literary and philosophical productions are studied merely as the expressions of particular cultures at particular times, rather than as the expression of universal truths. So this is the way the humanities uh, studies foreign cultures, just as expressions of those cultures, not as scientific truth. Now, fundamentalism is the opposite of this. <clears throat> fundamentalism involves a literal reading of a text and the misapplication of deficient understanding so derived to dubiously related contemporary situations. Religious fundamentalism imposes modern religious divisions, which are necessarily based on historical and institutional accidents, on the interpretation of ancient or medieval text. So let me give you an example of fundamentalism. Uh, here's a beautiful painting of the tradition of holy tradition of masters made by one of the uh, the disciples of Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, who's depicted here in this painting, uh, honoring Guru Dev, his teacher Swami Brahmananda Saraswati, seated under this umbrella, who was the Shankaracharya of the North. In other words, in the tradition of Shankara, who's depicted here with his four disciples. And Shankara is depicted as the student of the, a line of teachers going back to 
Narayana. Uh, so in this picture, uh, here's here's Guru Dev with uh, radiant light showering over the globe. Now, if this is the globe, then what ground are all these teachers and this river situated on? Is this the earth? It can't be because the earth is all here. So uh, if we read this painting in a fundamentalist way, literally, then, then there's a, then there's a problem, right? Uh, we have a, a contradiction presented in this picture. You can't be showering uh, knowledge on the whole globe while, while sitting on it, right? Well, this is exactly what the Puranic texts uh, have been interpreted. Uh, they've been interpreted in this kind of fundamentalist way. Okay, the Puranic texts also depict the universe with several layers of heavens above, a flat disk of the earth, and several layers of hell below. Okay, and here the uh, uh, the, the center of the uh, earth being a flat continent. And India is depicted at the, at the center here, with and then uh, India is in the southern part of it, with oceans at the south and. And it's uh, projected that this continues all around. So we have a continent in the middle and oceans around in several uh, layers of dvipas, one island, one ring within an ocean, an ocean within another ring of land, another ocean on the outside of that, and so forth. Okay, culminating in a ring of mountains on the on the outside. Uh, and uh, and that's uh the uh rose uh, the rose apple at the at the center with mount meru at the center and so on okay so chris Mikowski analyzed uh this as saying that thus the piranhas pre present a vast and detailed geography of an enormous earth filled with continents and peoples some located millions of kilometers away from bharata of course, it is difficult to coordinate this account with the geog geographical knowledge known to us from other sources, either past or present. Okay, so there are there are other texts, okay, even in Sanskrit, even in the first millennium, okay, where they calculated the the correct size of the of the Earth. They recognized it as spherical. They set down mathematically demonstrable distances between the equator and Ujjain and between Ujjain and the Himalayas. In the Sahyadrikanda, as in other similar material, it is quite clear that authors communicated real-world geographical knowledge. They knew just where places were and how far and in which direction and what sort of people lived there. So, the generation of what we would consider to be practical geographical knowledge, we have to conclude, was not a function of Purana geographies or cosmologies. Okay? So if you read them fundamentally, if you read them in a fundamentalist fashion, you have a conflict between texts which give correct knowledge of places and distances and the kind of uh, disposition which the Puranas uh, put things in, and and so you have to you'd have to reject one or the other. But there were enterprises which tried to coordinate them unsuccessfully. So we if we have to recognize that the Puranas are are describing things in a in a way, all these hells below and heavens above and what's in them, not because they're describing cosmology accurately. But because they're making moral judgments, for example, as Dante did in his Inferno, uh, he placed certain people in hell because because he thought they were morally uh, morally deficient, and other people in heaven because he admired them. Okay, so it, it, it's a way of making moral judgments, not a way of writing about cosmology. Just as this picture. Is, is not meant to make a statement about cosmology and geography. It's meant to 
to uh, to make the point that the holy tradition is showering knowledge on the world. And that's a totally different point. So we have to read things accurately. We can't read things fundamentalistly and, and then uh, claim that they are telling absolute truth and reject everything else. We, ha- we find this going on in in uh, today's world all the time with with the fundamentalist doctrines in Christianity claiming that the whole world was created in seven days and by seven days I mean seven periods of 24 hours uh, and uh, we find this in um, in other realms a- as well so let me just uh, wrap up now and say that uh, <clears throat> there's a, a a distinct way of talking about things in the sciences. Okay, Newton discovered gravity, but uh, uh, human expressions are are different. Okay, you you uh, design things, but uh, you design languages, but but he you also make discoveries about certain kinds of of structures and. And so similarly about texts in India, okay, the Ashtadhyayi was composed by Panani. It was not discovered by him. And yet we could say that he discovered the efficacy of generative grammar. Okay, Shakespeare composed Hamlet, but he also discovers or reveals certain things about human emotions. And uh, uh, similarly, Madhuchandas, the son of Ishwamitra, composed the first supta of the Rig Veda, but he may have discovered some values of fire that are composed in him. So what is meant by saying the Veda is eternal? It's not meant to say that that the language Sanskrit uh, existed trillions of years ago, okay? And that the, the Veda, as we have it, uh in uh in syllables in 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 the sanskrit language <clears throat> existed that way mill- millennia ago or from creation to creation but rather that the veda is the veda is is written in sanskrit sanskrit is a language which arose at a certain time in the evolution of language and that language has continued to evolve afterwards in, into uh, Prakrits and into modern Indian languages, but that the Veda expresses certain ideas, certain concepts about reality, and those concepts are eternal in the same way that uh, that Newton's expressions and writings about gravity uh, are, are just the expressions of a certain time and place. But the principle of gravity is something that was eternal and applied to all people in all places at all times. So this kind of same distinction we have to make, what is universal science versus the idiosyncratic humanities, which are just talking about expressions of culture. Okay. We, we have to make that distinction and understand that, uh, that uh, the study of India has been as that, that Indian knowledge is just ex- making cultural expressions of things at, as they were considered at certain time and places. But European knowledge is universal. This is a false way of looking at things. Okay? Uh, all cultures are producing knowledge, which are expressions of certain times and places, are influenced by them. But they're also the expressions of brilliant individuals who have insights into the nature of reality and the insights they have are universal and and may express scientific facts and universal truths about reality as it is in itself. And we have to take this kind of attitude towards understanding Indian knowledge as well as understanding uh, Western knowledge. Uh, we, 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 we have to locate the expressions that may be influenced by their cultural surroundings but understand that they're making statements and expressions about reality, and we should try to understand what expressions they are making about reality. So philology 
is the the love of understanding of literature and language, and we want to engage in philology uh, to to uh, to make a careful study of literary works to understand what the author wants to express and the common or universal principles and experiences he or she wants to share. So that's uh, that's what I wanted to uh, express. And uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take uh, questions or host some discussion on this these points. Thank you, Dr. Shah. That was illuminating, really innovative reinterpretation of Orientalism. And thank you for reorienting us uh, about that. Sanchari, could you please moderate the discussion and take questions? Thank you. Yes, uh, we are open to any questions. If the audience has any question, could you please direct them or write that write it in the chat box? It seems we don't have any question. Uh, we have a con comment uh, from Surina uh, who says that this is very insightful. And I would agree with that completely. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm adding everybody to, they can now unmute and ask questions if they want to. Everybody can do that now. So Dr. Shaf, meanwhile, I can, maybe I'll ask a question. What is the, Thank you. do you think this Orientalism is so deep and so, we are so probably even, uh, I guess myself included, we may be so uh, uh, unknown to us that even uh, people in India are doing it to Indian traditions and how we study India. Yes. So uh, much much of the scholarship in India, particularly that which is influenced by by Marxist thought, uh, you know, the so-called left wing uh, uh, in in India often accused of being mm -hmm. uh, continuing the doctrine of, of Westerners about India and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, had, is a center of, of uh, what was considered to be uh, sophisticated thought. Uh, mm -hmm. Uses, uh, uses this kind of uh, understanding and I think engages in these kind of theoretical undertakings. Um, and, then, and then we also have uh, the opposite. We have a fundamentalist movements in India which are, are, uh, are making the, the errors which I mentioned about fundamentalism. And so you get these, these uh, opposing camps fighting with each other and uh, neither one is recognizing... Uh, what really needs to be done in scholarship. There are a few scholars who are, who are doing real scholarship, both in the West and in India. And, and that means, uh, you know, scholars who really investigate and understand texts, make critical editions of texts by uh, comparing manuscript sources uh, and evaluate them properly and, and make uh, substantial contributions to our knowledge. So I don't want to say that it's, you know the this kind of theoretical um project has completely obliterated real understanding uh there are some scholars still working but but uh, it's it's by far the minority and and um and unfortunately it's it's dying out and particularly this kind of discourse that considers sanskrit as as the the new dominating force which was is sort of depicted like a, a European colonialist, okay? It's the dominating force with subjugated um, indigenous uh, ways of thinking and so forth, and sets up a dichotomy between uh, the, um, the uh, Vedic knowledge and other knowledge that might have been in India expressed in the Buddhist tradition or the Jain tradition and so on. Um, and uh, and this is a false dichotomy, and this is this is based on the same kind of false understanding of of Hegelian doctrine applied in a Marxist sort of way that considered that uh, that there's this dominant 
ideology and, and subjugated peoples. And the only way the subjugated peoples can can uh, get equality is by overthrowing the dominant. And so there's an anti-Sanskrit movement in India, which is absurd, okay? It's absurd because Sanskrit was the language of, of knowledge transmission in India for three millennia. And it's the, the transmission of knowledge by Buddhists and Jains as well as, as the Vedic tradition. There is no evidence of any other knowledge in India earlier than uh, the Vedic tradition, okay? And so to, so to consider that there was some indigenous knowledge that was there uh, among peoples uh, that, that uh, was subjugated by the uh, Vedic tradition is just projecting this dichotomy, this Marxist dichotomy on India. And it's, it's just a false theoretical... <laughs> Uh, anachronism what we what we do find in close examination of the vedic tradition it, it actually is that there's a continuity of knowledge through the vedic tradition and in in buddhism and jainism in texts and they're engaged in discussion with each other for uh, a millennia and uh mm -hmm. and uh, so so one should be very careful one doesn't want to throw out the the, the vedic tradition because that is the history of Indian knowledge. Mm, uh, we have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Professor Maya. Uh, if uh, you can unmute and ask the question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you ended your talk with mention of philology, and it feels like uh, it's something that's really fallen out of fashion in some sense. You know, graduate schools and other spaces don't seem to train students anymore in rigorous philology. So I wondered what might be a way to connect the past with the present, especially in terms of philology and maybe also digital humanities and the work you do with the Sanskrit library. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, so the Sanskrit library wants to encourage people to do uh, fundamental investigations fundamental in investigations meaning to make critical editions of texts to uh, investigate what those texts say and express them translate them uh, and express those ideas clarify the, those ideas for uh, for others uh, and and this and and to integrate and think about what uh, what the fundamental ideas in those texts are and and not to focus so much on on these ideologies of of conflict and dominance and political structure, which is just a repetition uh, over and over again of ideas in Europe and in the in the nineteenth century. And why should India be engaged in that kind of project? India has its own uh, huge body of knowledge that that is begging for investigation and uh, millions of manuscripts which are threatened with destruction if they're not used to make critical editions quickly uh, a, a huge body of knowledge the largest body of literature sanskrit holds the largest body of literature in the world prior to the invention of the of the printing press and and such a huge enormous reservoir of knowledge has to be investigated for what it has to tell us of value for us today and and not uh and not considered just something which oh that's what people in the past thought and and not just to dismiss the ideas this uh, this thing of anachronism of, of imposing modern um modern political confrontations on the past you know even the idea of the caste system as somehow being uh like slavery and in fact, even the the objections to slavery are are often imposing anachronism on the situation. Okay, who who was it that's guilty of slavery? Well, you know, in America, we're going through a lot of this kind of thing, and we have people today wanting to to uh, make amends for the sins of the past. You know, my parents came to this country just in the last generation and had nothing to do with slavery a hundred years earlier. And uh, and just because I have a, a white face doesn't mean I'm responsible for slavery. 
And yet we had books written, uh, you know, uh, white fragility, as if all whites are responsible for it. And similarly, this is this kind of thing goes on in India too, that somehow all Brahmins are evil because they're representing a, a dominant culture of the past that oppressed people. This is this is absurd. Uh, the uh, the uh, the the projection on on the the caste system also as if it it, it was subjugation. It, it wasn't always subjugation. It was originally a recognition of the of the different roles that people play in society. There are there are people who are intellectual and academic. There are there are rulers. I had I had a family. I, I had a discussion with a family in India, a uh, family related to my teacher, uh, when I was studying with a, a pundit in India in the late eighties, who uh, who took the the Purusha Sukta as somehow a, a direct literal justification of Brahmin superiority. Uh, but this is just totally false. The the expression that the Purusha that somehow the head of Purusha became was the was the uh, became the Brahmins and the and the arms, the Bahu were the Rajanya and the the thighs were the uh, Vaishya and the feet the Shudra. That is not an expression to say that that Brahmins are higher than or better than Shudras. The, that expression is to say that Brahmins are the intellectuals, the Kshatriya are the are the the might of the society, the warriors, the the uh, the uh, the Vaishyas, the thighs are the powerful the powerful element of society that upholds everything else upholds the the brahmins and supports the brahmins and the kshatriyas and the and the feet the shudras everything depends on the shudras they're, they're what's holding everything up they're the they're the workers so so it's a it's an economical depiction of society it's not a uh a political justification of domination um so uh, we uh, also saw that Santosh Gokhale had his had put his hands up. So if you have a question, Santosh Gokhale. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Dr. Shah, thank you for the enlightening lecture. Um, and as uh, someone was saying earlier, I mean, what we are then effectively left with is primary philology. But then there has to be some interpretation done on the texts one is editing and trying to translate. So how do you see that? Because the moment you get into that space of interpretation, you would run into such um, ideological conflicts and they have to be addressed. We can't just say um, we stay away from them and focus on primary philology. So what, in your view, would be then um, the, the balance once the philology part is done or when someone is interested in going beyond it? Yeah, and I don't mean just philology, but I also mentioned, uh, you know, uh, interpretation and expression. Oh, even translation involves some interpretation inevitably. But, uh, uh, but focusing on translation studies, okay, this is when, when I was in, in school, translation studies was not an object of study in itself. It's something a translator had to become somewhat aware with to guard themselves against making false, uh, in uh erroneous interpretations by accident but uh, but it's a secondary study and similarly uh, uh any any theoretical discussion of of uh biases and so forth is has to be understood as a secondary thing it's something that's useful to prevent oneself from from making bias from having biases but it's not the primary object of study the primary objects of study is is to make critical additions, translate, explain, examine philosophical ideas. Philoso philosophy is understanding reality. Philosophy is science. Philosophy is is uh, it means the love of knowledge, right? It's uh, love of wisdom. All the sciences used to be under the under the. Uh, realm of philosophy in the uh, 
in the uh, medieval European um, organization of the disciplines. So what I mean is to study reality as expressions of knowledge about, about to study texts as the expressions of knowledge about reality, not to study them just as the expressions of culture, just as the expressions of some worldview or other, you know, just studying it because, you know, we're, we, we like uh, Indian dance just because it's an expression of Indian culture, not as an expression of, of beauty, right? It, it, it's also an expression of beauty. So, uh, so that's what I mean. Uh, we have an attitude that we want universal knowledge, not that we're just interested in, in the relative position of, of this. Uh, another, we have another question from Kirti. Um, Kirti, if you could unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I'll read out the question. Uh, okay. I'm a scholar from Suriname working on interreligious relations in the Caribbean. I agree on the fact that we must not literally take religious texts or even Western approaches such as Marxism to understand own reality. What is your perspective on developing theories in the face of scholars who determine or influence what is okay for true scholarships? Uh, even I used a neo-Marxist framework for understanding local interreligious relations as the Caribbean consists of post-colonial societies. Well, uh, what I what I consider is well, I I think I just said that um, uh, even even my discussion today, I do not consider to be. Uh, fundamental scholarship okay but i i did engage in it but i i take this to be a, a minor thing and, and so i've never written i've never written this i presented this uh kind of uh, presentation before but i've never written it up and published it i just haven't taken the time because i don't consider it to be fundamental knowledge i want to engage my time primarily in in doing that kind of fundamental research so yes, one does have to step aside, and I also stepped aside from that a little bit in order to address the community of scholars. Uh, and so one does have to do that a little bit, but one should try to keep it in check and keep one's efforts on what's important. And, and one should train one's students to consider what is important so that so that they will also in, engage in 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 real knowledge so the sanskrit library has started uh courses to train particularly uh well everyone but particularly um indian students in contemporary technology as used in making critical editions and doing other analysis of texts so we're bringing indian knowledge into the computer age at once uh by by these kinds of instruction uh we don't have to to do it the old way on 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 paper and so forth there are new ways of doing it we should use all the new tools there's uh there are all kinds of new methodologies for understanding uh, vast bodies of data vast bodies of literary texts and so forth and and we can't do it yet with a sanskrit knowledge because that Sanskrit knowledge hasn't been brought into the digital medium. It's only, only the modern languages with contemporary productions in the digital field that can undergo that kind of analysis, which is why so many people today, what are they studying? They're studying tweets. They're studying emails. I mean, come on. Emails and tweets are not where true knowledge is expressed. We look, need to look at the, at the texts which are making serious contributions now in the modern sciences in in the physical sciences uh, clearly people are now publishing their their works digitally and those can be subject to uh digital methods but where's the scholarship on on ancient india and on on medieval indian and texts a hu huge body of knowledge it's not in the digital medium and so we can't study it using contemporary digital tools so this is the this is the project of the Sanskrit library to bring the Sanskrit knowledge into the digital realm 
and enable this sort of uh, use of contemporary methodologies to study those texts. Um, we have another question from Ananta Babili. Yes. Uh, thank you for allowing me. Um, I, uh, Pankaj, um, Professor Shah, nice, nice hearing uh, from you and been quite enlightening. Um, my observation goes back to my, you know, the pedigree I share with Pankaj, uh, University of Iowa. Uh, although our trajectories are different, I was in media studies, communication studies. Uh, and uh, I'm in, I'm located in Iowa now. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. About so, an hour's uh, drive from the University of Iowa. So I was so rooted in the, in the colonialist uh, tradition of learning in India that, that I actually was, first time I was like, challenged and exposed to uh, critical thinking uh, on specifically dealing with Indian thought was William uh, Wilhelm Hoppers. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. You know my, He was also my professor. At yeah. the University of Pennsylvania, and, and his seminal book, you know, the India and the West, was was just a, a phenomenally yeah. inspiring text for me, which actually launched my trajectory into Orientalism, post Orient, you know, in a, in, a, in the sense, you know, Gayatri Spivak and and post colonial and subaltern history. Uh, so my uh, challenge has always been how we use English language to express. Uh, the, the the challenges in, in the uh, epistemology and the tradition traditions of learning, and when we engage in this uh, sort of opposing uh, dichotomies of East and the West and um, uh, India versus the Western thought, um, it always reminds me that when when we talk about Western thought, we're actually talking about a dominant ideology, not per se, engaging in, in the tremendous diversity uh, of uh, schools of thought uh, of Native Americans, ranging from Canada to the United States to Latin America, uh, how ancient thought of the Native Americans um, has totally been washed out in this discourse, you know. So I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on how we engage East versus West? And when we talk about Western knowledge, um, it is specifically sort of a European epistemology, isn't it? I mean, not, not exactly engaging in all the native traditions that are in the West. So any thoughts on that from you? Yeah, uh, the... Uh... Well, you're you're talking you're 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 expressing exactly what I I was talking about in this uh, how the theoretical discourse of Orientalism has dominated scholarship and and it seems you're you're trained in that you're you're well into it um, and uh, and and so so the object in my opinion of someone like you who is well trained in that kind of understanding and and the theoretical background. You've got the understanding of what what it takes to to guard against the the biases, and just look to see well how can we uh, recapture those ideas which have been uh, have overcome. You know, this the Sanskrit tradition has not been overcome as the American Indian tradition was in the same way because. Uh, the American Indian tradition was was hardly expressed in in writing uh, before it had a chance, uh, you know, before it had the chance to do so, it was nearly wiped out. So, so recapturing the ideas of American Indian thought is quite difficult today. But uh, there's still an opportunity. There still may be, um, you know, elders around in the tradition who have have some oral inheritance of their knowledge. Uh, there are, I have, have been some Native Americans who have written about their cultures and and so forth. So it is possible to capture those ideas to a certain extent. But uh, one has to be careful about studying, doing that kind of study. Um, I, uh, you know, some that, that kind of anthropological work is particularly prone to 
an assumption that the the isolated group one's investigating is truly isolated from contemporary culture. So I, I, I attended a lecture at the University of Virginia where I was, uh, where I taught my first semester uh, in 1992 at a colloquium where one well-known anthropologist presented her findings about a, a group in India. And she was quite proud of herself as having captured a song which which was sung in in that group uh and uh she she wrote it and and uh, uh expressed that poem in in english translated it in english and i was thinking to myself how does she know that this is an expression that was handed down in this culture independent of the surrounding culture since she just recorded it in the in the 1980s how does she know that it wasn't inspired by someone listening to the radio uh, uh, to the Beatles and uh, and uh, and it was composed as part of an interaction with the contemporary society? So one has to be careful about about anthropology. Anthropologists used to make an assumption that if they found an isolated group of people, that that group of people represented an ancient state. It, ain't, it represented something thousands of years old. And this is, of course, a false assumption. So anyway, those are comments about what we need to be careful about in doing that kind of anthropological work. But um, so I, I, I consider the really uh, reliable anthropological work to be archaeology, where, where you, of course, have to do a lot of interpretation because you're dealing with thin data, but uh, extremely important to recover uh, recover the uh, fundamentals of society. So, for example, with the Indus Valley, Indus Valley civilizations, we know hardly anything about their knowledge. Okay, and there are people today writing all kinds of theoretical theoretical works, trying to say that uh, India was the Veda Vedic civilization, or India, uh, or or uh, India was uh, uh, was the Tamilian uh, was a Dravidian civilization. Okay, and we don't know, and we still don't know, and nobody has yet deciphered the Indic script, and assertions to the contrary are false. Why? Because there is no text found of any considerable length, and and all of the texts found are so short, and there's not enough uh, consonants of the various signs, so that more than fifty percent. More than 50% of the signs are of unique uh, reference. They're, they're unique signs. You, you can't determine the meaning of a language when, when half of the signs you have in it are unique. You need repetition in context in order to figure it out. So what is necessary? Archaeology. You have to find more inscriptions in Harappan script in order to be able to decipher it. So stop the theoretical argumentation in in midair in clouds, and and it's a waste of time. And and start digging. There's still so much work to be done. Right. Uh, do we have any more questions? I think not. Um, yes. Yeah. Over yeah. to you, Professor Jen. Yes. Thank you, Doctor Shaf. That was a Great way to summarize your entire presentation. Stop the argumentation and do the real work. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> really like that. You have to right. get your hands dirty. You know, you can't just uh, <laughs> yeah. sit back and and theorize. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, would like to invite you to Flame whenever you are when you, whenever you happen to be in Pune, and uh, we'll continue our discussion. I'll send you an email also. Uh, but yeah, I, I regret you had invited me there before when I was in yes. Pune, but uh, COVID was was rampant yeah. at the time. So I, yes. I do hope to get back to India and, and visit you there. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you again, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for your questions, I, and it was a, a pleasure to address you today.